thulelo ya Africa borwa e tshegeditse ka bojanala batho ba tlhaga ba le mafatsing a khakala go tlo bona diphofolo tsa rona hone mo Africa borwa empa ha re sa di sireletse re tlo ipona re rile jwang dumelang ra le amohela ho talk se and today our conversation is around the conservation of our wildlife joining me now is student from the University of Botswana ke a boteng ka mogalang mafale ra go amohela ho talk se thank you re kopane ka jeko le le batsha re tlo bua ka diphologolo a re bolelaganyane ka conference tsa halang ka jeko this conference uh, organized by the South African South Africa Institute of International Affairs and it's called the Saya Youth Wildlife Forum 2017 e kopane tsa youth from all over Africa go tla go bua ka di khantse di thorontsang di phologolo le makhabisana ga mo Africa a re kopane le ona youth yone e o hone ko mobile studio ng sa rona re tlo tlo sentle gore di phologolo tsa rona re di sireletsa ya are One of our greatest dangers to wildlife in South Africa is poaching. Rhino poaching has been rife, but now the numbers of elephant poaching has also gone up. Speaking to us today about how do we conserve our wildlife are young activists that are making sure that we try to preserve and do our best as a country. Our first guest, King Gamukhelang Mafale, who is a University of Botswana student. Welcome to Talk Ese. Thank you. Hello, we also have Tyler Booth, who is a Youth Policy Committee. Welcome to Talk Essay. And last but not least, we've got Ademu Musa Zikari, who is an SDG advocate. We also welcome you to Talk Essay. Thank you. Nga mo khelang kitla watlo simun laka wena papa. Hanga te di pofolo zaro na rele batu hanke ridi ela choko hanke resheba kore ki ingse nung kore saite chala moli fatting with in relation to to wildlife. How important is it for us to preserve our wildlife? Illegal wildlife, just for starters, maybe people don't know what it means. Uh, when we speak of illegal wildlife, we mean all commercial trade in non-domesticated wild animals uh, all over the world. And it's a very long chain. Uh, when someone takes the rhino from, from South Africa, the rhino horn, it doesn't only end here. It goes thousands of miles away. Mm. Yeah. And uh, on the environment, uh, it disturbs the balance of, of the ecosystem. It's possible that in the next coming years, children are only going to be seeing rhinos from, from TVs and books. There won't be any rhinos. How important is it for our mm. children to, mm. to be able to see these animals in mm. years to come? They need to know. It's nature. It's their nature. God created this for them and no one has the right to take this away. And generations to come, they need to know. It's their right. Mm. Yes. Tyler, with this being very close to your heart, what stories have you heard of that are, are really heartbreaking when it comes to the poaching of animals? Well, the closest for me, I've visited the Kruger Park for most of my life, go there on family trips. And the most heartbreaking thing for me was once we saw the carcass of a rhino that had been poached and the vultures circling and it had just happened. And the heartbreaking thing is there's nothing we could have done or anyone could have done to stop that at that time. And it's just so unpredictable. And also the fact that there's rhinos that have and babies that they've killed the mother and the baby is now orphaned like from a humanitarian pers perspective if that were to be a baby child we would also care more so why aren't we caring about animals like we care about people because they are feelings too as we've seen they do cry they do mourn the loss of their loved ones so how rife is rhino poaching in the country at the moment it's very rough i think it's very organized as well considering the fact that we find it mass loads have been found um there's syndicate rings, um, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's terrible and also the fact that community members, that's what they're resorting to because of their situation or poverty stricken situation mm. or lack of other things, um, that's what they're resorting to as a form of money and that's not helping anyone. That's true. Ademu, when we, we, when we talk about poaching in its entirety, we often focus on, on animals but we also have plants that we are losing. And as, as uh, the gentleman alluded to earlier, that we would like for future generations to be privy to the animals. But how important is it for also to preserve our plants? Well, the issue of unpoaching is not one that should be taken with levity. We've got to realize that flora and fauna uh, actually contribute to eco-balance. So therefore, there's this more reason why we need to do something about this. And when you look at some of these plants, just as you said, uh, some of these plants are very medicinal, uh, they are ornamental, and they have lots of benefit to us. So there's this more reason why we need to do something about them. And sadly enough, there are many persons that don't know about this, including those who dwell in communities where these, um, where these uh, floras are being poached. 
So they need, they need to be enlightened as well as, uh, they really need to be enlightened in this regard. Mkamukhalang, in terms of the people that are actually poaching our animals, mm. do we know who they are, Batswa mm. Gai, um, and can we actually stop them? Mm. Uh, the black market in the Asia, in the Asian countries, Vietnam and their neighbors. And then those guys, they have money, and then we have poor locals here. So they use their money uh, to entice the locals to, 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 to help them in in poaching because the locals they, are, they they know their local areas very well. Those guys they don't know our local areas. Mm. Yeah, so it's it's the locals and 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 and, and outsiders and, and people that are outside the yeah, country. Like and what sort of money are we talking about? Mm. I mean, mm. I hear that there's different incentives for the actual poacher yes. to the person who's cutting off the horn. That's true. That's true. Uh, when the rhino horn reaches Asia. I think it's worth about 66,000 US dollars per kg. Sure. Yeah, and a rhino horn is about maybe 2 kg or 1.5 kg. But the money is divided into, into stages. Uh, for everyone who will be, the guy who will be showing the poachers uh, the rhino tracks here, they get a piece. The guy who will be smuggling the rhino horn outside South Africa, they get a piece. The guy who will be shipping it out, they get a piece until uh, the, the guy at the top of the chain who gets 66, uh, the 66,000. Uh, US dollars. Mm. Mm. So everyone gets that, that cut down the chain. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation and we hope to see you doing more work within preserving the wildlife. So thank you for that. Thank you. Ko khae o tsebo gore o kana bo bua le rona mo Facebook re Talk SA ka bo wa re ngwalla le kwala wa re bolela gore ke eng o se wena o setsang within community how ho sireletsa dipofolo tsa rona re tla le bona ga re tsa papa Peter go amohele hape ho Talk SA ka tsa ke re bua ka go sireletsa dipofolo tsa rona tse leng kona geng. Did you know that South Africa's got the largest population of rhinos even though we started protecting them with at least 10% of poachings haven't gone down last year that is still three rhinos a day killed for their horns. Joining me now are gentlemen from the US Embassy. I've got Hagen Moroni, welcome to Talk SA. Thank you very much. As well as Nico von Mertens who's also from the US Embassy. Morning. Welcome to Talk SA. Gentlemen, we were talking about poaching earlier on in the segment. Um, it has been identified that a lot of the poaching is syndicated, a lot of people coming from other countries working with South Africans in making sure that they take these precious, very vital animals away from us. As the U.S. Embassy, how do you view this uh, in terms of how rife the situation is? Obviously, this is a, it's a transnational problem. Um, the United States government uh, cooperates very closely with the South African government because we both believe that this is a serious problem uh, that has a variety of impacts. Uh, among those impacts are economic development, on tourism, on economic issues, on local communities. It has border security and national security implications because it's a transnational organized crime issue. Mm. Nico, I'll come to you. Uh, how, why is biodiversity so important to the world? Well, sure. Um, I think, it, as my colleague mentioned, um, it's adding a tremendous amount to, in terms of the value of, uh, you know, kind of you know, the, the symbiotic relationship that we have in the ecosystems we live. You know, we depend on them for, for our agriculture, we depend on them for our food, and as well, they, they present a tremendous, you know, uh, kind of beauty to our lives. And so, um, you know, having that kind of, you know, symbiotic relationship is vital. Mm. It's very important for us to preserve it for, for future generations. What are we doing as a country that we're getting so wrong that we're even allowing for other people to come in and work with us in terms of poaching our animals? Well, I think that's something that the U.S. Embassy is really proud to support this Wildlife Youth Forum, is that it gives youth and many of the, 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 the members that we have here today, um, you know, a, a chance to elevate their voices and bring their local solutions and they're uh, involved at the grassroots level in many cases. What are the costs? How much is it costing our countries to ensure that we, we really preserve our wildlife? Uh, well, that, it's, it's an extremely difficult question to, to put a number on. Obviously, we, we provide millions of dollars of assistance, uh, not just to South Africa, but to countries around the region. The, the Youth Forum here today has representatives from 11 countries around the region, and we have programs in, in many of those countries. Um, uh, the assistance that the United States provides in South Africa in support of South Africa's goals 
uh, goes everywhere from researching the problem, uh, so funding NGOs and non-government organizations to understand the issues. Indeed, I just want now to open up to many of the students that are here today, just to give us your input, but most importantly, what questions do you have for our panel? I'll start with the lady right here in front. In what ways can we as the local community become more involved and have incentive to actually work towards combating wildlife trafficking and anti-poaching? That is a very pertinent question because if we're not working together with our communities, mm -hmm. then only half the work is done. So what practicalities can we give to our communities in terms of making sure that we preserve our wildlife? Nicola? Mm -hmm. I think one of the key ways would be through um, this U.S. Embassy sponsored Wildlife Youth Forum is that um, I know that there's a delegation here that's focused on social media and how to tap into a resource like that to share campaigns and to share information and ideas. Thank you. Our next question is from the gentleman. If ever the government is to legalize wildlife poaching, what impact will it have on biodiversity as a whole? Mm. Mm. Uh, um, first of all, you can never legalize poaching. If you legalize it, then it will not be poaching. It will be legal hunting. Now, this is what happens if... Because now we're saying it's poaching because the hunting of the animals is not allowed. Uh, for these reasons. Let's take the rhino, for instance. If we were to allow the hunting for the rhino, already the rhino is about to be extinct. And it will go down. Uh, let's take the elephant, for instance. If we were to allow the elephant... Uh, 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 irresponsible elephant hunting. It will go down to, and our, our children, they will not have the, that chance to appreciate the, the uh, uh, having these animals. And then another one would be just on the ecosystem itself. Remember these animals in nature, they exist to balance the ecosystem. Now when you take down one element of the ecosystem, now you're shifting the balances. Mm. Yeah, Again, do you have a different view to that? No, I, I was just going to add on the last point uh, my colleague made about the, the ecosystems. I heard a great story. I was down in Cape Town, uh, in actually in Hermanus the other day, um, hearing about the abalone poaching issue. Yes. So not just rhino poaching. Obviously, there's a lot of other animals and plants that are being poached. Um, and uh, they were describing how the size of the abalone that is being poached from the wild is going down in size which means they're taking the larger specimens, now they're getting the smaller specimens. It's an indication that it's moving more towards extinction of these, mm. these mollusks in the wild. And in 10 years' and time, the, we predict that the impact that of that is that have. that is a food source for seals. Okay, yes. if there are fewer seals that have that food source, seals are a food source for sharks, right? You see the, the, the impacts that sort of spread in the ecosystem. And there's a huge tourism industry in South Africa related to shark diving, right? You can see the immediate sort of economic impacts of something like that, not to mention the criminal element that is put into play. Now, abalone is actually a good example because there is legal trade in abalone. Yes. Abalone is not restricted, and there are abalone farms that produce it. Yes. But the poaching of abalone is almost double the number of legally produced. Um, and it has not solved that problem. Mm, as we continue that debate, our last question is coming from the gentleman right at the back. Uh, you know, one of the things we have to acknowledge is that we definitely need flora and fauna, right? But the question is, how do we explore these um, without overconsumption in tandem with the sustainable development goals? Um, if, if I could say, actually, we have a forum that's specifically aimed at trying to address that, which is the UN Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. Um, and that is the international forum through which we try, as the Sustainable Development Goals are UN goals, uh, try to make sure that countries that see an impact on their own biodiversity or on their own populations, we call them range states, those, those countries that have those populations, South Africa, for example, rhinos with over 80% of the world's rhinos. We look to South Africa as the leader on rhinos. Um, and so coming together as different countries and agreeing what are the mechanisms that we'll put in place to try to protect those species, try to put in regulations to restrict the trade, try to make sure that only things are taken out at a sustainable level so that you can regenerate populations, trying to get at that sustainability issue specifically through this international forum. Do we legalize it and what impact will it have on our society as a whole?
Welcome back to the final segment of Tokese. Today we're talking about preserving our wildlife. We have been in conversation with young students, young people who are trying to rally forward in terms of making sure that we do preserve what is so precious to this world. Joining us now on Skype is David Newton and he is the director or the regional director for an organization called Traffic in Eastern and Southern Africa in the IUC. And David, welcome to Talk SA. Now, David, we have been talking about poaching and I know that's very close to your heart, but are we actually making progress in this regard? Well, from the traffic perspective, uh, and we study wildlife trade and uh, the impacts that trade has on species survival in the wild. So we're very concerned about the uh, sustainable management of wild resources. Now, uh, from the outset, it's clear that we are all consumers of wildlife products, whether it's uh, tuna that we enjoy or perhaps game built on. Uh, we all make use of, uh, of a resource that needs to be wisely managed. But we're only one link in that chain. You have retailers that sell those commodities to us. Uh, you have wholesalers and exporters and international traders who uh, sell it to the retailers. You have buyers, you have middlemen, you have uh, traders in the areas where the wildlife resource arises from. And uh, of course you have the communities that are involved in harvesting that resource. Or if it's in the case of pets, then you have collectors and trappers. So. Uh, so we have a great self-interest in uh, making sure that uh, if we want to continue enjoying those resources, uh, that we must look after them for the future. Now, David, it's not just our tourism sector that has um, issues in terms of our biodiversity, but also our agriculture, our medicinal plants, taking care of our society as a whole. How do we correct this? I think uh, the challenge is... Uh, can be uh, significant depending on what species you're talking about. Uh, specifically with respect to the black and white rhino, I think we're facing a very serious problem uh, with poaching uh, to supply rhino horn into the Asian trade. Uh, I think we've reached the point now where poaching levels are just slightly under the uh, reproductive level of the two species. And uh, so the, the problem with that is, is that uh, uh, if poaching does get the upper hand and tips the balance, then uh, potentially those species could go extinct, uh, which would be a very sad end. Uh, looking at a completely different species, uh, such as abalone, uh, this is a marine mollusk or a, a snail uh, that is uh, uh, collected uh, by local communities in uh, the Southern Cape and the Southwestern Cape uh, for uh, mainly the Asian market. And uh, one would think that that is a good thing, but unfortunately the, uh, the vast majority of that trade is uh, illegally collected. And, uh, and so the, the, the species under, is under immense pressure. It's interesting to note that uh, the vast majority of uh, trade uh, arises from South Africa's neighbouring countries that don't even have the species uh, indigenous to their countries, including Zimbabwe, which is a landlocked country. And uh, so the vast majority of the abalone going to uh, Asia, mainly Hong Kong, is uh, of illegal origin. Well, thank you so much, David. That was David giving us his input. I want to now turn back to our students and get any comments or suggestions that you have or anything that we've learned out of today's topic in terms of making sure that we preserve our wildlife. I'll start with the lady right here next on my left. I'm Ritendo Oshoma from Zimbabwe and being a part of this Wildlife Youth Forum has helped me understand that as young people we've got a major role to play and we can also be engaged in our voluntary works of monitoring the wildlife activities that are happening within our communities and we can also chip in with the construction of bylaws pertaining to wildlife conservation within our communities as we try to eradicate illegal wildlife trade and poaching. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is so true because we can't only rely on government and for other people to be doing the work for us. We need to get involved as well. We have another lady at the back. Your comment? 
My name is Sandy Silem Konza and I'm from the semi rural community of Jagastad located in Mpumalanga. I work with Generation Earth and we're trying to get much of the youth involved in environmental and wildlife conservation. However, it is a very trying task considering that I come from a very impoverished community and nobody has the resources or finances to be considerate about wildlife conservation as everybody's just trying to put a plate on their table. So it's very inspiring to see a platform such as the Sire Wildlife Life Youth Forum that's trying to get the, the youth involved and also the U.S. Embassy that's also trying to get the youth involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is a very relevant point, gentlemen. A lot of people in the country are actually just concerned about putting food on their own plates. Now, to also have the animals and everything else within the habitat that we need to care for, what's your take on that, Nico? Yeah, I think, um, indeed, I think, though, there are steps that everybody can take. Um, you know, steps that, that don't necessarily cost any money or don't necessarily take that much time. And with a little bit of additional knowledge and a little bit of additional understanding in terms of the, the benefit that wildlife have in our overall ecosystem, people can think about how they recycle and how they are, you know, uh, pursuing agriculture or how they're managing water or other waste. And through those, they can take, you know, uh, concrete steps that would very much um, benefit the ecosystem. That's true. Yeah. Hagen? Mm -hmm. um, I think Nick said it very well. I, I do think that there are a lot of steps that communities uh, can take. Certainly, uh, individuals' livelihoods is something that needs to be considered. Um, and certainly, poverty is an issue that we all need to address, mm -hmm. all governments need to address. Mm -hmm. um, I did hear a great story from an advocate who does education in the communities about trying to help them understand the jobs impact of tourism, particularly wildlife tourism. Mm -hmm. And he had a group of students in the room each stand up and say, okay, your mother is the pilot taking the tourists to South Africa. Your father is the customs official at the airport. Your mother is the combi driver that takes them from the airport to the mm -hmm. lodge. Mm -hmm. Your mother is the cook. Your father is the cleaning person. Your, and walking th had everyone in the room stand up mm -hmm. and then said, okay, let's say we don't have the big five anymore. Okay, so you're fired, you sit down. You're fired, sure. you sit down. It was a very I mean, poignant description of it. Now, it might have been a little bombastic and a little bit over dramatic, but I think he was trying to get the idea Try across that there really are economic impacts uh, for those local communities. Anything that we can take away from this topic in terms of what we need to do as individuals to help the process? Nico, I'll start with you. Sure. I'm just really inspired by the passion, the commitment, and the energy that all of the youth participants have brought to this conversation. And I hope to continue to, to empower and elevate their voices as part of this conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's also a good thing to see people my age uh, having these big thoughts about com uh, uh, combating illegal wildlife trafficking. And uh, com anti pushing starts with you. Yeah, it's our all responsibility. That's true. And lastly, Hagen. Um, I, I think it's a great idea that we continue to listen. These kinds of forums give us the opportunity as government officials as we design and implement programs to support our mutual goals, to make sure that we're listening to, to the people themselves, to the next generation of leaders with their ideas, and as we integrate those ideas, I think we can make a difference, and I think those individuals can contribute to that. And thank you, gentlemen, for contributing to this topic today, and also to these young, bright minds that have contributed immensely. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts, and I'm sure everyone else who's sitting at home watching has really taken away from this. So that even future generations can benefit from them. Thank you for watching Tokese. Hopefully, I'll get over to you. Or I'll get over to you. At SABC.CRZA. Kaparaka Tobega Kayana conversation. And I'll get social media pages. Sarona. Re hashtag Tokese. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you.